What's up, comic book community? My name is Joe, and this is 360 Comics. One of the things I really enjoy about buying bigger comic book collections is you can usually find some more interesting things in there than a typical small collection. Whether it's signed books, ratio variants, rarer indie books, or something completely different, there's always something in there that surprises me. Now, if you remember last week, I bought a 30 long box collection. I showed off the bigger key in a video already and I'll put that link down below in the description if you haven't seen it yet but today we're going to go over some of the more interesting books that I have not found in other collections stay tuned don't forget to check out our last video so you can enter our huge Thanksgiving giveaway. We're giving away these two slabs right here. First appearance of Kingpin in the Daredevil Run, 9.4 white pages. And first appearance of Bane, 9.4 white pages. All you have to do is subscribe to the channel, go watch that video, and leave a comment on that video, not this one, with an interesting Marvel and DC fact, and that enters you for a chance to win these books. Good luck. All right, without further ado, let's get into these interesting comic books. And just a reminder, this was from a 30 long box collection. I uncovered it at a flea market. The guy didn't have it with him, but we exchanged numbers and I went to his house a week later. He just wanted to move it for bulk. He had already made his money off of this collection and was looking to clear up some space. So he ended up selling it to me for a really, really great price. Let's kick it off right here with this book, Dr. Doom number one. This is the 1 in 50 variant. So this is a ratio variant of a modern book. Some people stay very far away from the ratio variants. Personally, um, I think they're kind of hit or miss. There are some of them that I, I really like and I want. Um, and there's others that I'm like, no, nope, 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 don't want that. So, um, you know, I, I do think they're hit or miss. It really depends on, um, the quality of the book as far as, is there a key significance or something like that? Or is it an issue number one? Um, and then there's also just who did the cover and, and what the cover is. I actually forget who the artist is for this, but this is just clearly a really awesome Dr. Doom cover. And despite this book coming out in 2019, this is actually the first solo Doctor Doom ongoing series. Now that's if you exclude Doom 2099, uh, which you know isn't really Doctor Doom, it's a, a future alternate universe whatever version of Doctor Doom. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this is a, a great run to read. I, I recommend it. Um, and this 1 in 50 variant is certainly really, really cool looking. Uh, there were, there was like a nice little pocket of um, ratio variants in this collection, all from 2019. Uh, I believe at least all from 2019 uh, this was one of them um, and this is the other one that really stood out to me the rest of them were like 1 in 25s and stuff like that 1 in 15s but this one right here this is a 1 in 200 of Absolute Carnage issue number four. It's a virgin cover. It doesn't have the trade dress on it. And, you know, given it's a one in 200, it was a much, much lower print run than, um, you know, most of the, the printings of this book. It doesn't have a ton of value because there's no real key significance, but there are plenty of modern collectors that like to get the high ratio variants and the virgin covers. So it does have some value. And uh, this will be available for sale at a future claim sale because I am not super into collecting this kind of stuff, but there are certainly collectors out there that are. Uh, keeping it with the Marvel theme, but going way back to the Bronze Age, we've got fantasy masterpieces starring the Silver Surfer number one. Now, initially when I saw this book, I freaked out for a second because it is the same cover as Silver Surfer number one, but this is a reprint of that book. You don't want to mix it up. Uh, always look up at the top, fantasy masterpieces. Um, Star Wars number one has a very similar one. Same cover as Star Wars number one, but it's like, I think it says like movie masterpiece pieces or a uh, special movie edition. I forget, but um, nonetheless, reprint of Silver Surfer number one. Nonetheless, really great collectible and perfect for reading if you don't want to crack open a, uh, a Silver Surfer number one, which is a pretty expensive book. Uh, this is a perfect reader copy to grab, um, but don't get confused. Uh, this next one, I had never seen the foil version of this book. This is Ultimate Spider-Man number one. I believe this would be considered volume two. Um, this was like, they, they kind of, I almost feel like they 
teetered back and forth between volume one and volume two. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, nonetheless, Ultimate Spider-Man volume two, I believe. And this is a foil cover. I've only ever seen the just straight white cover of this book. Um, but this foil variant actually sells uh, for a little bit, I think about 15 bucks online. So this one, uh, not something that I collect, but will be available at a future claim sale. Uh, then we got a classic right here. Anything from Star Comics, which is an imprint of Marvel from the 1980s, I shouldn't say anything, but a lot of that stuff has some collectability to it because it wasn't as highly printed, or at least it doesn't seem as highly printed as uh, some of the regular run of, of Marvel stuff, um, especially when it comes to that 25th anniversary border cover. Um, I think the Heathcliff one is like the most expensive one because uh, I... I just it wasn't printed super highly or anything like that. But anyway, this is Peter Porker, the Spectacular Spider-Ham. Number one, it's not his first appearance. That's in Marvel Tales, number one. Nonetheless, really great run. This character has become... Um, a lot more well known in the last few years through the uh, Into the Spider Verse movie, uh, voiced by John Mulaney, which was a great choice. Uh, personally, I have this entire run in my personal collection already, so this one will be up for grabs uh, at a future claim sale. Uh, this next one is pretty interesting. Uh, you can see it is polybagged uh, in an envelope, and uh, it's got the original address of the guy who got this. Um, this was a UNICEF giveaway book. Um, and I actually, I, I cut it open to show you what book it specifically is in the poly bag. I'm going to take it out and, you know, with poly bag books, you never know what the condition is going to be inside, but fortunately for this book, it's a nice thick cover. So pretty much all the copies that I've ever cut out of a, a poly bag have been really, really nice. Uh, I am likely going to send this in. There were multiple copies still in the poly bag of this book. Um, and the reason I'm going to send it in is raw. I think it sells for maybe 10 to $20 somewhere in there. Um, but a 9.8 graded copy sells for close to $200, between $150 and $200. So I got to look at them. Uh, this one, I'm actually noticing it's got a little ding in the corner. So I'm going to kind of see, maybe I can press it out. Otherwise, this one won't get set in because it's really only worth getting that 9.8. But really awesome cover. Uh, I'm not sure who did this cover. Is this a McFarlane? No, I guess it wouldn't be McFarlane because we got that giant tongue. Uh, Jim Craig and Dan Day did this cover. Really great one. It's got a little bit of foiling up here at the top. Um, but yeah, I'm going to put that one aside because we're going to look it over and see if we can uh, we can squeak a 9-8 out of that. Um, moving on to a little bit of DC stuff. This one got me super stoked because I grew up on this show as a kid. Samurai Jack. This was Samurai Jack special number one. And this is the first appearance of the character in comic books. Um, for those of you who don't know, this was a Cartoon Network show and it even says Cartoon Network right up there. Um, I guess early 2000s might have been late 90s but certainly was on in the early 2000s uh when i was you know uh 9 10 11 year old kid and uh loved loved this show really cool cartoon network show and this is a phenomenal cover um to go along with that so th this book has some value it does have a, a decent sized spine tick in it uh so this one i don't know it's tough to say because I, I really liked this property as a kid, but I'm kind of stingy on the high grade. So I might end up selling this one to try to get a higher grade one, or I might just keep this in the personal collection for the meantime. We're going to have to decide that at a later date. Um, but going right along with this, another Cartoon Network property here, Powerpuff Girls. Um, this is Cartoon Network starring Powerpuff Girls number one, as opposed to Powerpuff Girls number one. Uh, this one is their first appearance. Then they got their own run, uh, and that book does have value the you know the the first ongoing powerpuff girls run uh issue number one but this one is the one that has the most value right here um you know anytime it's like a kids show property um always look out because a lot of those books end up retaining more value uh because they're not um they're not taken care of as well if it's uh you know children buying and reading those books think about uh batman adventure 12 a book that came out in like what, 1993 or so? Um, you know, most books were just printed to death, and I'm sure that one was, but, um, you know, 
high grades are worth a lot of money because they weren't taken care of as well because they were marketed towards kids. This is probably uh, an instance of that as well. And the first parents of the Powerpuff Girls, they are still to this day a very popular um, property. In fact, my wife and her friends were just Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup for Halloween this year. Um, we got another television show cartoon related property here. This is a book I'm always on the lookout for. This is Ren and Stimpy number eight, I believe. Yeah, number six. Uh -oh. There we go. Uh, yeah, issue number six of Ren and Stimpy. And this one is a newsstand, and that is kind of hard to find from this mid-90s era. But um, the the cool thing about this book, it, it you know, it's a great Spider-Man crossover, all that, but uh, this is actually Dan Slott's first ever work on Spider-Man. And he has kind of become known as a Spider-Man uh, creator. Um, you know, he certainly has worked, uh, you know, all of his, not all of, but uh, the majority of his important work is on Spider-Man stuff. So um, this being his first work on Spider-Man, really, really fantastic book. And, you know, being a newsstand from the mid-90s, that is pretty cool as well. And I got one more uh, TV-related book right here. And I just don't want to... Uh, have it fall over again, so I move some stuff. But we got Spider Man and his amazing friends, number one. Now this is uh, this is a one shot. There's no other book uh, in this run. You know, it's not listed as a one shot or anything like that. But nonetheless, um, you know, this is the first appearance of Firestar in comic books. Um, she is one of those characters that I says um, I, I say uh, has. Uh, Harley Quinn syndrome. That's the, the term that I use when a character first appears in a television show and then is later incorporated into comics. Harley Quinn, first on the Batman animated series, then in Batman Adventure 12. Another good example is... Um, X-23, Laura Kinney, who first appeared on X-Men Evolution, the animated series, and then uh, first appeared in comics in NYX number three, and then uh, X-Men number 450 as, first, as far as her first in-continuity appearance. Uh, this is similar to that. Um, for those of you who did not watch, uh, I watched reruns of this show all the time as a kid. I had it on VHS. Uh, Spider-Man and Amazing Friends. This was an early 80s, I believe, uh, Spider-Man television show where him and Firestar and Iceman are roommates, and I thought that was just such a funny, funny little thing. Um, and yeah, you know, this is Firestar's first appearance, and she was later incorporated into the X Men, uh, starting in issue number 193. So that's also a good book to pick up because that's her first in continuity appearance. Moving on to some indie stuff, we've got um, from. What company is this? Blackthorn Publishing. This is How to Draw Transformers, number one. Um, this book has some value just because there are so many Transformers collectors out there. Like, such a popular IP, uh, especially for kids who grew up in the 80s. I'm a little bit younger. I was born in 1990, so this kind of missed me. I, I, I had Transformers, but it wasn't, like, the big thing at the time. Um, but, yeah, How to Draw Transformers, number one. Uh, you'd be surprised the going rate of this book, especially in high grade. And uh, it's a newsstand. I've actually owned two copies of this and both were newsstands. So it might be a book that was only printed with the barcode on it. So uh, I have to look into that a little bit more before confirming. Now, these next three are 100% staying in the personal collection. We got Space Usagi number one, number two, and number three, the full three-issue miniseries of Space Usagi. And if you watched the last video, um, or not the last one, the one from last week where I went over the bigger keys, you'll remember that Usagi Ojimbo number one was also in this collection. That is staying in the personal collection as well, trying to flesh out my Usagi stuff. I still need that first appearance in Albedo number two, a very rare book, hard to find. In fact, in this collection, I was really hoping for it, especially once I saw these and Usagi Ojimbo number one. I was like, maybe, fingers crossed, there's an Albedo number one. There wasn't, but the hunt continues. Uh, then we've got some Aliens. Uh, this is Aliens number one. Uh, this is the second printing, but nonetheless, all the printings hold some value because this is the first appearance of uh, you know, the Aliens in uh, comics in general. We got a, a Dark Horse um, 
publication, and then also from Dark Horse, uh, Predator number one, and this is, I believe, the first Predator in comic books. Um, so these, you know, go hand in hand with each other. You know, there's been some crossover between the the two IPs, and um, you know, uh, Dark Horse Comics uh, certainly uh, has been the 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 front runner uh, with those those two uh, those two. Uh, IPs. Uh, this was this was a funny one that I, I needed to throw in. Married with Children, number one from Now Comics. Um, more importantly than that, this isn't doesn't have too much value, but you know it's a little funny. Married with Children, but it did have all three issues of the uh, Kelly Bundy special. That's uh, issue number one, and for some reason these got out of order. But we got issue number two and issue number three and who doesn't love Christina Applegate we got three photo covers of her and uh you know great great person who's uh had a, a ton of longevity in these like comedic roles and stuff like that you might know her from this you might know her from Anchorman but um you know a very very attractive woman as well definitely great to see on the cover of a comic book uh moving along to some really interesting one here. There was almost no silver age in this collection, but this one was in there. And, and you know, whoever had this collection certainly got these books well before Peacemaker was ever even rumored to be in a DC project. But uh, this is issue number three of Peacemaker from the 1970s or actually this would have been late. Yeah. Late sixties. Um, so that, yeah, silver age. Uh, this was by Charlton comics. Uh, he first appeared in, Oh, what was it? Fighting Five number 40, I think it was. That was his first appearance, but then got a four-issue limited series. I'm doing all this off the top of my head, and I hope the information I'm relaying is correct, but you can always correct me in the comments if it is not. Uh, this next one is a funny little parody here. This is the Green Gray Sponge Suit Sushi Turtles. It is a parody of, of course, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I flipped through it. It was pretty silly stuff, um, but yeah, I, I love it. You know, there's there's a bunch of parodies of Ninja Turtles. There's the uh, radioactive uh, adolescent black belt hamsters. That's a, another one that you'll find pretty often. Um, this one was really cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there is a uh, very interesting metal band called Guar, and uh, this is a comic book um, written by them and uh, in relation to a character that they created called Skullhead Face. And these guys are like over the top, like where Kiss does the whole like makeup and like pyrotechnics and all that stuff. Guar took it above and beyond and went way more extreme than kiss or any other band ever has uh go look up on youtube if you're interested in seeing what a guar show is like i've been to a couple of them and they even have a couple restaurants as well they have a, a place called guar bar in richmond virginia delicious greasy bar food uh, definitely recommend checking it out if you're ever in that area but uh this was really cool there were a couple guar books in there but this is uh the first appearance of skullhead face so i figured that was a, a good one to show off in this video uh then we've got uh faust number one and there was actually a run of faust and i think it was the complete run i'm not a hundred percent sure where it ended but i have issue one through 15 so i'm thinking that is the complete run uh key collector only goes up to like 12 or something like that and has that listed as like a really low print run scarce book um, but I actually have 13, 14, and 15, which I would assume have even lower print runs, and 12 had a print run of like 2,000-something. So this is an indie book um, by David Quinn and Tom Vigil, and uh, apparently I think uh, Key Collector also said that uh, Faust was announced for, it was optioned or picked up in an option uh, last year, so... Maybe there'll be something in the future. Nonetheless, these books are hard to find due to the low print run. And uh, yeah, they're really like gory, more adult themed comic books. Um, speaking of some gory stuff, we got Gore Shriek number one. This is a cool book. This is the first interior art by the great Greg Capullo. B before he ever, you know, worked on uh, Spawn with Todd McFarlane or Batman New 52 with Scott Snyder. Uh, this is what he was doing back in the 1980s or early, not maybe this might have been early 90s, but Gore Shriek number one. Uh, first interior art, and I think in this run, I forget what issue, but it also has his first cover art. 
So always look out for those if you see them. Uh, harder to find indie book. Now this next one, this is uh, the last of the the indie stuff here before we go back to some signed books from Marvel and DC. Um, there were eight total copies of Spawn number one in this collection. Um, not, not like a super rare book or anything like that by any means. I just thought it was interesting that there were eight of them in this collection. Um, I have, I think what, six or seven here. And then there was a, a big run of spawn that I just kept together. So I didn't, I didn't pull that one out. Um, but you know, spawn, a very, very popular character, Todd McFarlane, a very popular creator. And, um, you know, fingers crossed there eventually will be another spawn movie. It's been announced for 10 plus years now uh jamie fox is slash was tied to it i'm not even sure what the deal is with that now but uh moving on we've got a couple of signed books here and this one is uh new mutants number 100 the last book of the run as well as the first appearance of the x-force and this is signed by and i'm gonna say this wrong and i know i'm gonna say this wrong uh fabian nicieza nicieza Nicieza? I'm not sure how to say his name. He's a co-creator of uh, Deadpool and X-Force along with um, Rob Liefeld. And he signed this book. And the cool thing about it, he signed it inside the front cover, which is what they used to do. Uh, now you see everything kind of signed on the cover of books because... Um, you know, people like to get them graded and displayed and stuff like that. But as you can see, this book signed on that inside, uh, right down there at the bottom, beautiful signature as well. Um, and this is a nice one. This isn't something that I would really send out to get graded. Uh, just a reminder, CGC does not verify signatures, but CBCS does. CGC will give it a green label, whereas uh, CBCS will verify and give you a yellow label if it is, in fact, a real signature. Uh, so if you ever want to get something graded um, that's already signed, you got to send it to CG uh, CBCS. So heads up on that. Uh, this is signed and numbered by Andy, C or sorry, Adam Kubert. There's a bunch of Cuberts. Uh, it's along the side here, and it's numbered out of 10,000. So this isn't like a super rare book to find signed or anything. There clearly were 10,000 of them, maybe as some kind of promotional thing uh, with Midnight Suns. But nonetheless, this is a book that people do pick up as part of the Midnight Suns run, and it's signed, so I I'm sure it has uh, some value. Then we're moving on. Oh, this one is really, really cool. This one is awesome. Wolverine number 50. Um, great die cut cover. You know, this is a book that's pretty common, but still a really, really cool book signed right over there by the great Mark Silvestri, who has one of my, actually, he, he literally did my favorite, uh, comic book cover of all time, which is a Wolverine cover. It's an X-Men book. Um, I don't know why the, we're out of, out of, uh, focus here. Let's see. Let's see if we can get that back in focus. There we go. There we go. We fixed everything. <laughs> that happens sometimes. I'm not sure why. Maybe I need a new camera. Mark Silvestri signed Wolverine book. Uh, can't go wrong with that. Definitely one of the great creators of the late 80s, early 90s. And speaking of, we got a John Romita Jr. signed um, Punisher Warzone number one. He signed it right down there uh, with that JRJR, really uh, iconic signature that can, I can recognize anywhere. Very happy about that. Um, and actually, these these I forgot the, the two... Signed books, the uh, Ramita, as well as the Silvestri signed book. They both had pictures of them in the bag and board with the comic or, or tucked into the... I'm not sure if they were bagged and boarded. Um, as did this one. Boom! X-Men number two signed by Jim Lee. Jim Lee's signature, kind of hard to find. I, I don't come across it very often, at least, you know, as as far as, you know, how popular he is. Like, I see Todd McFarlane signatures all day. Jim Lee stuff, I don't see nearly as much. Uh, picture on the back as well. Really, really great. I wish this was like an X-Men number one or 11 or four. But, hey, X-Men number two with this awesome Magneto cover. I'm not going to complain about that. Now, the last book, the very last one, and it's really the Grail signature. It's 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 the one that you want. Stan the Manly. We got a copy of Sales to Astonish. This is a, a, a really interesting one because this was like a, a 
it was basically a preview book of what is coming out. Uh, and this is for 1993. Um, so I, I gotta look up and see if there's anything special about this preview book. If it previewed any important characters that came out in 1993, maybe. Um, but nonetheless signed by Stan, the man Lee himself in 1993, very stoked about that. Anytime I find a, a Stan Lee signature, it could be on any book. It could be on random XYZ 90s Fantastic Four book that's, you know, a dollar bin book all day. And I'm still stoked about it because that is, you know, Stan Lee. He's the one who uh, created so many of the characters and, and really promoted Marvel and, and kept it alive and, and kept it doing, um, you know, doing well over the years. And it's why we have, you know, he's why we have the MCU and, and so much of that stuff. So I don't need to say anything more about Stanley. You all know already he is the man as we call him. Um, but yeah, really cool stuff in this collection. Um, you know, random indie stuff, low print run things, some signed books, um, ratio variants, which you, you don't see often in, you know, you know, bulk collections of mostly non-modern stuff, but there were in there. So, uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed this video is something a little bit different. And, uh, if you did make sure you subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below. Uh, if you liked any of these books and make sure you go back and you like, and comment on the video, um, from Monday of this week for your chance to win, uh, those two slabs first Bane and first Kingpin in daredevil. Uh, also, uh, not tonight, Tonight's Wednesday. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to price some books because tomorrow, that's Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I'm doing a three day Black Thursday, Black Friday, Black Saturday sale. Uh, starting the night of Thanksgiving after dinner, you can relax with your phone. Hopefully you don't go into a food coma and you can hop on Instagram and check out a live sale. I'm going to do the same thing Friday night and Saturday night, and everything is 20% off so you can get some really really good deals and of course bundle things together if you buy something on thursday and saturday it can all get shipped at once that way you're saving a little bit money on shipping so that being said thank you so much for your time and until next time turn the page wash your hands